All right, so now I've constructed a new board. It's uh, three feet wide and three feet deep. Surely, this must mean that I have everything that I need. Yeah, but what about the height, Leif? Height? Is that important? Only if you want your party to take advantage of verticality. But don't care. You can stay in the little leaves. <laughs> well, crap me sideways and put the herring into it. I think you're right. But what... But... What... What... I know. What if we make some awesome looking rock formation that are miniature friendly? <laughs> Hey all of you wonderful folks out there, my name is Leif and this is my channel called Devs and Dice, where I paint miniatures or craft terrain for the tabletop. So today I'm going to show you how I did these quite functional, but in my humble opinion, also quite aesthetically pleasing rock formations. I really felt like these could elevate my tabletop experiences for future games. No uh, pun intended. Let's make some awesome rock formations. All right, so starting this project, I'm going to be using one of my favorite materials, which is XPS foam or styrofoam or insulation foam. It has lots of different names, but it's essentially a more dense version of the foam you see in packaging and such. Now, I wasn't really sure exactly what kind of cliffs I wanted to do originally, but I did have my mind set up on doing some sort of uh, <laughs> pride rock looking rock, which was more like a, a cliff that could be a lookout or something. And here I'm going to be using very little of my hot wire foam cutters. I'm actually going to be using uh, a scalpel and then some tools. And what you can see here is that I've basically cut out i don't know how many lines but a lot of lines you're going to be seeing this over and over during this process and the reason why i'm doing this is because i wanted it to be layered rock and i'm going to preface this by saying that i'm fairly proficient with the knife and i'm going to be doing this quite quickly so just stay safe if you're going to replicate this and, you know, do it with a speed that you're comfortable with. So here I am basically just going to glue two pieces together uh, using some foam glue. You couldn't use any white glue or actually even hot glue. But I wanted the bond to be really, really good, so I used that foam glue. Now once that had dried, I'm going to start cutting out the bottom section in a similar way. Now I wanted this overhang because it just felt like it could have been a nice sort of, uh, I guess, mountain or overlook where, you know, I can see easily a campfire underneath the overlook and who might be, you know, camping there. It might be the players or it might be, you know, someone that the players can sneak up upon and attack from above or something. These sort of formations really, I wanted to be quite evocative, but still be practical. And here we can actually see one of my problems. I noticed that the back end actually flipped up and these are metal minis, so they're quite heavy. And as you can see here, two minis and that little mountain goes belly up, so to speak. But we'll get back to that in a while. I wanted to go through how I did my mountains. And here you can see I'm cutting out like small, 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 thin lines. And again, I'm doing this because I want it to be layered rock. So I'm trying as much as I can to be quite organic with my cuts. And, you know, don't think so much about one single cut, but more... And I don't know this, but I, I, I would assume that a sculptor has a similar sort of way. And this is essentially what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying, I'm looking for shapes. I'm looking for interesting, natural looking shapes. And also a good thing, as you can see, have a vacuum close by because, yeah, it's going to be messy. Now this specific part was actually part of an arch that I knew I wanted because it just felt like 
it's such a classical thing and I wanted to just have one in my arsenal at least. Here you can see that actually I didn't have a piece that was that long so I had to use a toothpick and some hot glue and just fuse that sucker together. Now one thing when you use hot glue and you press it together you will inevitably have some you know overspill but usually if you use a low temperature hot glue gun uh, you can actually just you know peel it off with your fingers. Okay so as you can see now three rocks in the background are done but I knew I wanted some sort of more plateau-esque rock which was I think I think I was thinking that I was going to construct it by having three separate pieces and <laughs> during this process uh, I actually called them a little bit playfully like my little anvils and you'll see soon the process uh, or that part of the process where it looks bad that was when these looked like an anvil. And there you can see some sketches that I think was from my dwarven uh, fountain build that never got realized. So anyways, I'm gluing these together, and as you can see, it looks uh, starting to look a little bit like a funky anvil or something like that. But eventually you'll end up with two shapes, and I'm going to make two of these, and it looks a little bit something like that. Now I'm going to speed through this, but in a sense, it's the same uh, principle. I'm cutting a bunch of lines trying to have gameplay in mind, make interesting plateaus where, you know, full size one inch characters can hide, where perhaps halflings can hide. Trying to think as much as possible about the function than just the form, but I'm trying to hit that nice balance where I can say that this is aesthetically pleasing also for the eye. Here is a little bit of a panning shot over all of what we have so far. And you can see, actually now that I'm looking back at it, I wonder if I could have almost skipped the next step. Now I'm I don't I'm not sorry that I did the next step, but it feels like I had pretty good, you know, definition of those layer blocks. But first before we move on to the next step, we need to fix this uh, wobbly bit uh, on the rock it's simple it's basically physics right so i'm just gonna cut out some xps foam from the bottom of it and i had these uh what are these called bolts or nuts bolts whatever one of them that i'm basically just gonna weigh down uh, and hot glue into place and as you can see i have a piece of uh, baking paper that i'm just gonna lay this sucker on flat and I'm going to let the hot glue cool off and what you should be left with is a nice flat bottom. So time for the test. One, two, three. Okay, looking good so far. Can it do four? You know what? No, move the wizard over there. We need to challenge us. Yes. So all the four characters can fit on that cliff, which was nice. So that was a success. Okay, so time for the next step, which involves sculpt mold. This is essentially plaster mixed with some paper fibers. Now, it was a while ago since I used this, so I was a little bit rusty, to be honest. Uh, I didn't really remember all of the specifics when it came to sculpt mold, how it worked and so on. But you know what, let's do this the brave way. I started with just slabbing this on. Quite quickly, thankfully, I noticed that, you know what, this is actually removing quite a lot of detail. It is gonna, you know, harden up and give me some nice details. But I stayed true to the process and really the process when I work with Sculpt Mold is slob it on, get the approximate shape you want. Let it dry for about 10-15 minutes because this dries quite quickly to a touch at least. It doesn't like harden through and through. Now what I did uh, after that, and here you can actually see I had a little bit of excess of sculpt mold. So I figured, you know what, I'm going to do a couple of small mounds or whatever on top of these uh, mountains that <laughs> formerly were known as my anvils. And they actually turn out pretty nice I have to say. 
Now, what I was going to say was that the process when working with Sculpt Mold, for me at least, is to let it sit there for about 10-15 minutes. Then you come back over it if you want to with a wet brush because Sculpt Mold has a lot of almost too much detail. So I like to actually smooth that out a little bit because it, it sort of lumps up and whatnot. And once I've done that uh, on a particular area or, um, you know, one of these mountains, then I'm going to come in with my, I hesitate to call it a wire brush, but I guess it is a wire brush, but it's actually nylon uh, wire. So it's quite, you know, it's not as rough as a steel wire brush, but it still gives that definition of layered rock, which is quite nice. And you can see here, that it actually does give nice striations to the rock, which is exactly what I'm after. And this is what it looks like once it's dry. Now, I also had some excess plaster, so I actually made some molds or some plaster, some excess uh, sculpt molds. So I made molds out of it. And I figured, you know what? I can actually probably add these afterwards. And just to be honest here, these hadn't fully cured. So they were still a little bit cold and wet to the touch. So I figured I would try to wet a spot uh, with my brush. And then, and this is a fairly stiff brush. And then I just sort of press in this mold uh, and actually just blend out the edges with uh, my brush. And it actually worked pretty nice. And you'll see here and there that I have some rocks added to it. Now once all of this had dried properly I went uh, over it with my Mod Podge and a little bit of black paint. Now for me personally I don't really I'm not after absolute full coverage with the blackness I actually just have a couple of you know dabs of black in here and the reason I'm having it is just so I can see clearly where have I painted and where have I not painted. And as you can see, uh, I use the cut off toilet rolls just to make sure that air flows all over the place because I also mod podge the bottom of my mountains, of my plateaus. So once uh, the mod podge had dried, I basically hit this with some uh, primer, black primer, with the airbrush so I could, you know, continue working quickly. Now I had some uh, cool gray ink from Dowler Rowney, which I got from Peter as one of my thank yous for fixing his uh, Citadel paint pots way back when. I figured I would try to use this as a zenithal just to experiment a little bit because I knew how I could paint these up using, you know, just dry brush, but I wanted to actually do a little bit of experimenting and see if I could, you know, get some nice results using a zenithal and then some inks on top of this. So I'm being quite liberal in places just to sort of get a good definition more. And it's hard when you're talking about zenithal priming an object this big. But I let's just say that since it was cool gray, I rather added more than less. Now, what I'm coming in with here is a transparent burnt umber ink, and this one is from Liquitex. And this was a starting color that I uh, fiddled around with. And honestly, I couldn't even show you because I don't know, but I mixed in some yellow sometimes and some green sometimes. And I'm not even sure what the paint pot, you know, contained in the end, but this is what we had after that step. Now you'll notice one quite annoying thing with inks, or annoying, it's, it's, it's fine if you know about it, but you can see that they're quite glossy, the mountains. They look quite, you know, wet. So I'm going to come in with some uh, matte varnish through the airbrush, and you can see how it actually removes those speculars quite nicely. Now this also actually protects the ink from becoming rehydrated, so... I really uh, recommend you do that if you're following along. Now I'm going to come in with some uh, ochre paint. Uh, I think this is Basilisk's Brown from Army Painter. And now I'm going to do those striations that I usually uh, do. I call this uh, the ketchup and mustard method. And this is where your mountains or your rock is going to start looking quite funky. 
but again, here I felt much more home with the process. And since I already went in with Burnt Umber as a base, I only needed to add the mustard, so to speak. And it looks kind of funky at this point, but yeah, trust the process. So the first color I'm coming in with is a darker gray, a field gray, and this is not a dry brush, this is more an overbrush. Remember, Rook is generally gray, but it has different undertones of, you know, uh, different yellows, reds, even blues uh, and greens. And that is what that undercoating has done for me. So now I'm coming in with some Stone Golem, which is a, a, a touch lighter uh, dry brush. And again, I am dry brushing quite heavily because I'm going to dial it up to 11 because I'm going to come back in with uh, my homemade wash as per usual. Now, I really prefer using a spritzer bottle when it comes to this wash. Uh, it feels like it's more economical, but also I feel like I have better control and I don't mess around with any paints underneath. So I don't, you know, disturb uh, paint that has settled in a good way. And it's actually, it's a lot easier to just, you know, have control with a spritzer bottle, ironically enough. And here is the result. You can see that they're still wet. And this is what they'll look like once dry. Now, if you look closely, you can see that everything looks much more realistic. But unfortunately, we've lost some of that highlight definition. It, it looks very good, like everything, it really, the wash really brings everything together, but we want it to pop a little bit more. So that's why we're coming back in with that stone golem, and this time around I'm being much more careful with what direction I am dry brushing in, and where I'm dry brushing. But I'm still putting on like a, a healthy amount, because again, it's rock, but just being more aware of the direction of the brush. Now, once that step is done, it's time to start thinking about basing. This was a little bit elusive because my first thought was, well, let's just smack on some, you know, static grass or some flock and call it a day. But then I started thinking, no, 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 no. I want dirt first. So I started out with my ground down coconut fiber, uh, which works wonders as a sort of forest floor foliage. This I'm just attaching using some PVA glue. Now I'm going to be using two types of static grass here, and I'm going to go over it quite quickly. The first one is battlefield step grass from Army Painter, and that I'll do on the majority of the areas I want to cover with uh, static grass. And then once uh, I'm done with this step, I'm actually going to come in with some battlefield green grass, I think it's called, the much more greener one. And that one I'm actually going to put more into the center of the grass patches. So imagine essentially you have some darker grass patches and here is the step. You can actually see I've already done one in the background there. That's my test piece. That, that rock was my sort of if, you know, something goes south, this is the one that I'll sacrifice. But here you can see I'm basically, you know, creating dots of uh, lighter grass inside the darker grass area. Now, once that is done, I'm just going to spray it with some um, Mod Podge and water mixture, uh, just to lock everything in. And once that has dried, it's time for the final details, which is adding some tufts. And I really recommend you to add tufts, you know, in strange places. Nature always finds a way. And I think now it's time to have a look at the final result.
Alright, good folks. Now, that's how I made some rock formations for my tabletop. I'm quite pleased with the result myself, but you know what? I want to know what you think. Please feel free to post some feedback in the comment section down below. I love interacting with all of you wonderful folk out there, and I make a thing to answer all of the comments I get. As always, if you like the video and you want to see me making more of these videos, please consider subscribing, hitting that like button, or sharing this with any friend you have that might find it interesting. The best way to ensure that I make more of these videos is to join my Patreon. If you join, then you will get an invite to my personal Discord, where you can talk with me or with any of the wonderful folks that are there currently. And on that note, I want to really thank my patrons for their support. And also, I want to extend a special shout out to my champion level patron, Mad Nurse. And also, my legend level patron, Leander. Thank you all guys for your amazing support. So with this, I want to thank you so much for watching, stay safe, and I will see you in the next video.